See the fish tug go by, smell the fumes of her diesel. She blasts off her horn, I stand there in the way. Hear the throb of her engine, the crying of seagulls, dipping and weaving around the old LCJ. Old Daddy J. Commercial fishing was part of the South Haven diverse maritime economy from the 1860s until the 1970s. Fishermen worked aboard tugs similar to the Evelyn S, the 1939 wooden gillnet fish tug, and others like it based on the Great Lakes. Today, the Evelyn S, 50 feet long with a 13-foot beam, is a restored fishing tug that has had many lives. Shipbuilders from Sturgeon Bay Boat Works built it in 1939 for William Selman Fisheries of Manistique, Michigan, and equipped her with a Kellenberg diesel engine. Michigan Maritime Museum volunteer and educator Frank James says the Kallenberg, built in Three Rivers, Wisconsin, was the workhorse of the era. It's, it was respected as the, the, the best that you could buy at that time. Virtually unbreakable, and if it does break, they can repair it right there. There's plenty of space around the engine uh, so that it, it could be worked on actually while they're underway. They had blow torches on that were aimed at the top of each cylinder and they would before starting the engine they would go in there and run the blow torches. It took about a half an hour to get from the time that they said let's start the motor from the until the time that they were putting a lot of soot in the air. In 1943 the Evelyn S was sold to Hawkorn and Charles Anderson of Frankfort, Michigan. They used her for commercial fishing until 1952 and sold her to a Muskegon towing company. The founder of the Michigan Maritime Museum, Roland Sylvester, acquired the boat and brought it to South Haven in 1979. After 36 years of service as a working fishing tug, it became one of the main on-water exhibits of this museum. Local captain Don Nichols remembers when the boat was first in the harbor and the fun they had with it. When there was a storm brewing on the lake, a good one, the great fun was to fire up the Evelyn and take her out and go for a ride. <laughs> and, and oh my God, I mean, we, I took some guys out there that had never been in seas like that. I'm going to say 10, 12 foot seas that we had that girl out in, and what a boat. I mean, she'd do everything but roll over. Sometime during the winter in the early 80s, it sank at the dock. And they went down there and they tried to find their museum and their museum was missing. It had sunk at the, right there at the pier. So I had to call, I believe it was the Olson's brothers, and they brought a giant crane down and put a, uh, straps underneath it and pumped it out slowly. And when they got it to the surface, it did float. And then Chuck Jensen brought out the LCJ and broke the ice in the harbor and uh, over it all seasons and then towed the Evelyn S across the harbor and got it into the slip and all seasons lifted it. The museum was able to get a grant and uh, a few volunteers and a few employees worked and got it uh, uh, around so that it could be viewed from the inside. It could be a walk on board. Uh, kind of a display. Over the years, there was water damage to the vessel from sitting in the elements, and in the fall of 2014, the boat was again restored. The first step was to move the Evelyn S to her permanent home on the campus. Once again, the big cradle lift was brought over by crews from the museum's next door neighbor, All Seasons Marine. Once safely anchored in place, the fishing tug was enclosed to protect it from the elements and allow craftsmen to perform the restoration during the harsh winter months of 2015. Most of this restoration was done by Hans Wagner. He's a graduate of the Great Lakes Boat Building School in Cedarville, Michigan. He got some guidance from Mike Kiefer, a local South Haven area boat builder. To fund the restoration of the Evelyn S, the city of South Haven in partnership with the museum, was awarded a $65,000 grant from the Michigan Coastal Zone Management Program, Office of the State's Great Lakes Department of Environmental Quality. A local match of $65,000 covered the $130,000 project. 
It's designed to promote tourism and stewardship through restoration and renewed exhibition of this fishing tug. This museum's extensive library of documents and photos, along with stories from local families of the commercial fishing community, help preserve the rich history of the fisherman's life. Thanks to hard work of many paid crews and lots of volunteers, a new outdoor performance area with a stage, accessible access to the restored tug, and this video station has been developed. The Evelyn S. is one of the last remaining gillnet wooden fishing tugs in Michigan. When describing commercial fishing, Frank James talks about the extremely hardy, highly skilled people, their fishing boats and equipment, and the era of limited communications and lack of refrigeration. His commercial fishing story starts with the boat. That when that boat's in the water, they're not going to see that bottom part, and that gives the boat a whole different profile, and uh, I, I want them to, to realize how much sinks down, which shows the weight of the boat, the, the mass of, of the thing, and uh, the, then, it, then it has a, a lower profile, so it's not so susceptible to wave and wind action up above. And you look at the placement of the engine there in the bottom of the boat, way, way, way low, and the, uh, the, the, the weight, the mass of that engine placed where it is, provides ballast, which is critical to that boat and, and keeping it stable out there in the, the big waves that Lake Michigan can produce. They had to carry ice with them to ice down the fish and preserve them. Uh, there was no refrigeration on the boat, of course. There was no electricity on the boat. The inland lakes around here were used to provide the ice. Uh, a team of horses and a sleigh and a group of men with saws would go out on the lake every winter and they would, all winter long, they would cut ice and uh, into blocks and they would take the ice and store it in ice houses and the uh, ice houses were all, all around. That was a business to have an ice house and when they packed that ice into a, a an ice house which had really thick walls and they got that thing filled up with ice that ice could last all summer long. Go aboard the Evelyn S and see the displays to learn of the tools used by Great Lakes commercial fishermen. Tools such as the power lifter that pull the gill nets full of fish on board for sorting and cleaning. Frank James describes the gill nets as long tennis nets. Uh, on the top of the tennis net we put some something that floats. It could be cork, it could be wood, or it could be, in later years, they used plastic and aluminum floats on the top. And then they, on the bottom of the net, they put lead weights, very similar to what they used to balance tires or whatnot. They were, they were lead. And the, the, when they would put the net in the water then, the lead wants to go down the float wants to go up and that stretches the net out underwater. The net, uh, the, the floats did not come up to the top of, or the surface. The net was totally underwater so boats and whatnot could go over it without getting fouled. And these nets were uh, at least the length of a football field long. Uh, and they would tie several nets together so they would have a gang of nets out there that uh, would be perhaps a couple of miles long. That would not be unusual. Uh, uh, the only thing that showed at the surface would be a flag at the beginning and the end of the net. And each, each uh, fisherman had his own uh, colors or whatnot so he could identify his net, his flags. The size of the mesh was important because that governed what fish they were going to catch and keep. The idea was that, that the, uh, the DNR would license them to catch certain species of fish of a certain size. They didn't want to catch a lot of little ones and they didn't want to catch the big breeding stock. They wanted to catch more or less the mid-sized fish. So the, the, fisher, the, the, the fisherman would, would uh, choose the mesh that would catch that size fish. When the, the fisherman brings up his net, uh, he has all the, the virtually the, the right size fish in there. He may not have necessarily the right kind of fish, but he's got the right size fish. And he... 
Judy Schlock, daughter of longtime LCJ tug captain Julius Allers, describes a method of drying the nets once the boats were back in port. They would be put on large reels to dry and to be mended as the net reel went around and then after they were fixed and dried they would be replaced into the net box to be set out in the lake again. Prior to his passing in 2014, local fishing legend Chuck Jensen recalled the long hours spent on the water on their family boat, the LCJ. You figured on a six-day week, leave the dock around seven o'clock, and uh, years ago when we fished perch and whitefish, we didn't have a very long run. But then later on when we could only fish chubs, we'd have maybe an average of an hour to three hour run to get to the nets. And then that would be probably three, four hours and then the trip back home. Judy Schlock remembers playing on the beach, watching for the tug as it came back home with the day's catch. We'd run to the pier and wave to him and he would salute the everybody that was waiting there and then they would also salute in front of the Coast Guard station to notify the the home crew to get the lines ready for landing and also you that would let my mom know they were off the lake and she'd go down and check and see how much work they had to do before he could come home for supper. The Jensen's brought in their daily catch and prepared most of it for shipping west and east out of South Haven. Years ago, it was mostly all railroad express to Chicago. We had a good service out of Bangor. And uh, then later on, semi-trucks, there was a trucking outfit out of Port Huron. They'd have a truck come down the Wisconsin, Wisconsin side of the lake, and one come down at our side of the lake and pick up the fish for out east. And they'd meet in Toledo, I believe, and fix their loads, and they'd take off for Philadelphia and New York. You didn't go to Walmart and buy frozen fish. If you wanted fish, you went to the fish market. They were called fishmongers that sold fish. And those fish people, the people that sold fish, relied upon a supply coming from uh, over here. And we, uh, if we didn't give them fish, they went out of business. And uh, so there was a, a symbiotic relationship all the way along the line there of the fishermen, the person who shipped it, the person who supplied it, and that meant that that fisherman is going to fish every day of the year that he can. An east wind would come, the wind would go out, they had nets out there, they had to get out to them, but they had to get out the river. Well, as the ice was heavy, like over four or five inches, those underpowered tugs individually could not get through the ice, so they'd all get together. Now getting that whole bunch together was a lot of fun. We got one Kellenberg fired up, now we got two, now we got three. Oh, today's the day, they're all gonna go play in the ice. It'd take the entire day sometimes to break a channel out. Once you had it out to the open water, the east wind would take it all out of the harbor in a matter of uh, hours. Sometimes a cruise from an ice-bound tug would actually walk to shore. And if we have to go ashore, we'll get out and walk. My father did it, my grandfather did it, and apparently in the old days they used to do that. It was after they'd been out on one night for a long time, one of the crewmen walked ashore supposedly for food and came home with a bottle of whiskey instead. And, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and people weren't too happy, they'd rather have had food. Judy Slock remembers carefully walking across the Channel Ice for a special ride in the LCJ with her father. I was just watching and the tug stopped, my dad got out, walked over, he says, you want to come aboard? I thought, oh, wow, yeah. I said, this is good. He says, now step where I step. And I stepped exactly in his footprints that would, so they would be safe and got to finish the day on the tug. Okay. I know at one time they were stuck out there and the ice moved as they were trying to get in. They got stuck in the flow and were carried south about halfway to Benton Harbor. Oh, wow. And by the time they came, did get in, then the engineer had failed to fill the emergency fuel tank and they ran out of fuel at the end of the pier. <laughs> and the Coast Guard had to go bring him in and my dad was not very happy about that. 
This was all done before modern day communications. Well, in the early days, they had uh, the flags up every morning and down by the Coast Guard station. You could get the direction of the wind. We didn't have any, uh, any radio up until, oh, it must have been 49, something like that around there, 48. That wasn't too reliable. I don't believe they thought about it in those days. They didn't have it, they didn't miss it. This is the LCJ, you know, it was named after me. Well, my father had a number of boats before he had that one. By the 1940s, he had designed and had this boat built over in Wisconsin. And I was pleased that he named it after me. And it was actually my, grand, my Danish grandmother's name. Usually named for the wife or a daughter of the fisherman. The Evelyn S is named for Evelyn Selman, which would have been a woman in the Selman fishery family from Manistique, Michigan. Aboard the Mary Jean, me and my shipmate Davy, we both turned 17. Girls weren't allowed, there weren't bathrooms on fish tugs, <laughs> and the crew was all men, so a girlfriend and I went out one time, I remember, and then I was allowed to steer the boat back to South Haven. And then the time when the tugs pulled out a couple of freighters out of the harbor, I was allowed to ride along for that. Now the bait house is gone, so are the fish tugs. The sound of the foghorn no longer blows. Times are changing, but my memory grows fonder. A misty, cool morning and a cane fish. The opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway and ocean going predators coming into the lake in the bilge of tramp steamers. The lamprey eel left the trout and whitefish population reduced by some 90%. The commercial fishing industry of South Haven knew it came to an end by the early 70s. There were exceptions, like the charter industry going after salmon that were added to the lake to help control alewives. That worked out for just about everyone concerned. And of course, the iconic Captain Nichols perch boats gave it a good 35-year run. Oh, Daddy, take me back to Van Buren County, down to the channel. One tug from this port's commercial fishing era, the LCJ, is still in use, owned by Bob Jensen, the grandson of one of the area's best-known commercial fishermen, Christopher Jensen, a Danish immigrant. He opened a commercial fishery in 1932 on the Black River near the Dykeman Avenue Bridge. The Jensen family operated that business until 1988. Today, grandson Bob Jensen and his wife Kathy own the LCJ, and they run a Lake Michigan tour boat and diving business from a dock close to where the family commercial fishing business brought their daily catch in for so many years. The boat is still equipped with the original Collenberg engine. Blowtorches no longer are used in the starting process. Now a glow plug warms the heads prior to starting, but the process still takes about a half an hour. The era of commercial fishing on the Great Lakes will be remembered for its hardy fishermen, sturdy wood fishing tugs, gangs of gillnets, and strong fishing families. Oh, Daddy, take me back to Van Buren County, down to the channel where the Black River flows, where the airsmen like fish and the bait house is waiting with a hook and a line and a king fishing pole. Now the bait house is gone, so are the fish tugs. The sound of the foghorn no longer blows. Times are changing, but my memory grows fonder. A misty, cool morning and a cane fishing pole. Oh, Daddy, take me back to Van Buren County, down to the channel where the Black River flows. Where the airsmen like fish and the bait house is awaiting. 
with a hook and a line and a kingfishing pole. Oh, Daddy, take me back to Van Buren County, down to the channel where the Black River flows. Where the airsmen like fish and the bait houses are waiting with a hook and a line and a kingfish and pole. Thank you. <laughs>